yes you are audible and visible thank you sir. good afternoon sir <clears throat> good afternoon yeah रामलो साहब नमस्कार सर सर बोलिए आई एज बोथ द स्पीकर है ज्वाइन लेट एट लेट्स स्टार्ट ओके सर because uh, 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 there is no need to wait for 5 minutes so should i start yes sir so yes, uh, good afternoon uh, we are very delighted and happy that uh, today in bharat amrit mahotsav and the platinum jubilee celebration of this great institute central institute of mining and fuel research is being celebrated on 17th 16th of november we will be completing 75 years and i am very happy and delighted that two eminent personalities in their respective fields they are known have agreed to deliver the talk so as a director of this institute i welcome both of you sir so sarath paleria sahab the he is director at moef and alexander strong is chief expert geodynamic research center masco it is my honor and privilege to welcome both of you in this webinar and the topic as suggested the director moef will be speaking on environmental impact assessment for mining projects and the experts from the masco he will be speaking on rock avalanches basic characteristics and classification criteria sir just to update you this institute foundation stone was laid down on 17th november 1946 and the campus was inaugurated on 22nd april 1950 and when the campus was inaugurated the then prime minister and president both were present physically in dhanbad because coal chain energy was very important area at that time and we have the centers at nagpur ranchi bilaspur ranigarh and rudki and two campuses in dhanbad so our footprint is in all the mining sectors and infrastructure projects and border road organizations sir so this is a brief update about the institute and now i request uh, dr more ramlu to coordinate this talk and i will be also listening from here both the eminent speakers on their respective topics i wel welcome again you sirs for your time for csir simpar i am sure that by your talk by your deliberations we will be enriching our knowledge and we will be more effectively contribute for the growth of this country with these words now over to ramlu Dr. Ramlu, you are muted. Namaskar, respected Director, International Cooperation, Ministry of Environment and Forest, Sri Sharad Kumar Palerla, respected. श्री शरद कुमार पलेला और बिलव डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर पीके सिंह सर डॉक्टर अलेक्जेंडर स्ट्रॉन्ग माय डियर कलीग्स फ्रॉम नागपुर सेंटर कलीग्स फ्रॉम हेडक्वार्टर्स धनबाद बिलासपुर सेंटर रुर्की सेंटर रांची सेंटर एंड रानीगंज सेंटर 
Good afternoon to all. Simfar welcomes to you all to this Platinum Jubilee lecture series, which is part of our Platinum Jubilee celebrations. It is our privilege to have with us Sri Sharad Kumar Palerla for delivering the Platinum Jubilee lecture. On behalf of our director, I welcome you by presenting a book bucket as a mark of tradition of Simfar. Yes, Kumar sir, this is for you. This book is on behalf of our director to you. Thank you. It is Thank you Atomic much. Habits. This will be posted to you by courier. Dr. Sam, we are delighted to have you with us here. And as a customary, we are also presenting one book bucket to you. This is the book for you. This is one of the famous books of our past president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. So this will also be sent to you very soon. Now it's my pleasure introducing Sri Sharat Kumar Palerla to this floor. Sri Sharat Kumar is a distinguished mining engineer and alumnus of Kothagodam School of Mines, Usman University. He is also a first class mines manager certificate holder and initially worked in Singareni for 16 years. He joined in Ministry of Environment in 2016 as director and discharging the duties in various departments of ministry. Some of his credible contributions in the ministry include Solid Waste Management Rules 2016, Plastic and Biomedical Waste Management Rules, Environment Impact Assessment, Policy Making, Development of Online Environmental Portal, Parivesh, and is also authored Draft of EIA Notification 2020. We are very glad to have you with us, sir, and I request you to present the lecture on Environmental Impact Assessment over to you, sir. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramalu. Am I audible? Dr. Ramalu, am I, am I audible? Yes, sir. We are getting your voice, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, at the outset, uh, I congratulate uh, for on celebra uh, celebrating the Platinum Jubilee celebrations by CSIR, uh, the Central Institute of Mining and Fuel Res Research Institute, Dunbar. And today, uh, this Nagpur regional office of yours is uh, conducting this webinar. And I'm very glad uh, that uh, invited me to and to be a part of this particular uh, the ceremony. Uh, in this aspect, uh, Doctor, um, the respected uh, director, Doctor <coughs> Pradeep Kumar uh, Singh, and uh, the, uh, the co-speaker, uh, Doctor Alexander Stroh, uh, Doctor More Ramulu, and all other the scientist uh, scientists and uh, the who are distinguished guests so who are associated on the floor uh, all you welcome today uh, the topic that has been asked me to deliver is that environmental impact assessment for the mining projects you know that the environment is uh, associated with the each and every sector activity and the project so mining is uh, uh, see since this uh, institute is a uh, basically uh, the uh, Taking, uh, carrying out the research research on mining as well as on the fuel. So both the sectors, the, both the mining as the fuel has the has got the consequences and the the, the integral part of our impact assessment, uh, the notification. Therefore, uh, so it is an out topic uh, 
uh, to have uh, this particular uh, uh, impact assessment of mining as well as the, the other related legislation and the, what are the rules regulations and uh, what is the scientific role to present so let me uh, share the my presentation uh, is it visible uh, so it's visible sir thank you thank you uh, basically the my presentation is on environmental impact assessment for the mining projects you know before that uh, impact assessment so the, what is the background so what is the genesis of this particular uh, impact assessment so there is a constitutionally it is a mandated and the, the, uh, it is a required not only from the scientific point of view but also on a legislative point of view and uh, it has been mandated you all know that so that environment the term environment was not there in the principal constitutional provisions but it was introduced in the 42nd amendment that this term was introduced and wherein the for, uh, article 48 states that uh, so it has given a responsibility as well as that uh, the obligations to the states uh, to endeavor the protection of environment uh, not only to the governments not only to the central and state government it also has given a, um, a responsibility to the all the citizens to protect and improve the natural environment so it has become a fundamental duty by virtue of the insertion of article 51a so like that uh, so the uh, this 248a gives the residual power to the central government so where there is no listing either in the state list or union list or concurrent list so such subjects including the international treaties agreements so the power lies with the parliament and it has to be legislated by the uh, central government by this background this particular environment environment protection act has been enacted by the parliament in 1986 to deal with the uh, different uh, uh, environmental issues so uh, by virtue of uh, the powers uh, of uh, um, uh, having and implementing the uh, multilateral legislations multilateral environmental legislations uh, so which are signed in the different uh, uh, fora of the international forums Uh, so basically, uh, uh, this has obligation has come to the central government. So you can see the Stockholm Conference 1972 is the base um, genesis for the uh, whole act, the Environment Protection Act. Though the act like air and water was uh, existing earlier, so this umbrella act has been uh, enacted in 1972. So subsequently. and the different conferences has initiated and ignited uh, the legislation of the different acts like biodiversity act has been initiated from the rio conference and stockholm conference in the further the subsequent uh, cops uh, uh, has made mandated for a regulation on cops ods and different single use plastic like that so for the example so how that multilateral agreements have initiated uh, so that is the intention of showing this slide so you can see how the environmental laws has evaluated evolved uh, over a period of time right from 1927 in the indian forest act and then uh, 1980 the forest conservation act 1986 the environment protection act then public liability act ngt act so like that uh, from 1927 to uh, 2021 so different acts and rules regulations uh, are evolved under this uh, environmental to uh, safeguard how to take how to protect uh, this environment you can see the governments in, uh, the governments in this so basically in the at the central government the ministry of environment forest and uh, uh, climate change at the central level and the state government uh, so the department of environment is a counterpart so whereas the uh, for the air and water acts the cpc in the state it is Excuse a counterpart sir in cpcb sir. yeah yeah please sir aapka presentation jo hai wo change nahi ho raha hai aur slide mode mein bhi nahi hai is it full screen i will uh, i will re reshare then i will reshare let me please now it's changing it's changing sir it's okay, okay. sir now sometimes i think that is it is taking some time let me share the screen itself so that uh, mm -hmm.
Is it changing? Yeah, it's fine, sir. It's fine. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Okay. Just uh, the I will uh, scroll the earlier slides. So these are the constitutional provision as I already explained, and these are the articles which so which is uh, really the given the power empowerment to the central government to legislate on the environmental subject. and these are the multilateral agreements where uh, so that environmental law has been initiated and uh, the genesis has come uh, from these are all the uh, the road map i can say how it uh, evolved uh, the environmental law in the country uh, so to take care of the different attributes of the environment so this is the government framework at the central level and state government uh, state government also for the administration of the um, uh, environmental issues i think up to this slide uh, so i have already covered and i think i hope that uh, so now the screen, uh, slides are moving can you confirm so okay sir fine sir okay sir fine sir see coming to the uh, this particular out of all those thing now that subject uh, now i am uh, coming to the actual thing that is the environment protection act so where uh, so this particular environmental impact assessment and environment clearance topics is covered so basically here the the, the, the mo most important sections like uh, most important section like section 3 a uh, power to constitute an authority and section 5 for the powers to give the directions and uh, section 15 is the penal provision so which is a criminal uh, the offense uh, so for a contravention of any of the of um, uh, provisions of the act so the offense is a criminal one then cognizance of offense has to be taken uh, to take the action by the courts then power to delegate and power to make the rules so these are all the different sections Uh, that is uh, normally utilized and uh, the, uh, the administered uh, during the implementation of uh, this particular act so coming this under section uh, 3133 uh, um, there so the responsibility of the central government to take care and protect the environment and take the necessary measures across the country you know that the industrial activity including a mining activity whether it is an oil and gas whether it is an hydrocarbon so definitely has got the impact on the surrounding environment including flora and fauna so therefore so it is required to the inbuilt the uh, in the project design itself in the during the development and planning stage itself so that uh, this particular eia environmental impact assessment has uh, got a significance so though it was the first it is mandated in 1994 by virtue of uh, notification in the 27 january 1994 before that also it has started to the river valley projects and subsequently extended to a large public sector projects requiring the pib clearances of course in the mining projects most of the uh, projects uh, of the <coughs> central psu or state psu do require uh, do got this particular activity uh, before 1994 also so in 2000 uh, subsequently it has been reviewed and revived uh, uh, in 2006 and presently eia notification 2006 in og and now it is under implementation however this particular notification has subjected to a several amendments i can say the more than 60 amendments were happened uh, from 2006 onwards so the government has uh, um, um, thought that to review the complete provisions and the draft of uh, eia 2020 was uh, uh, issued in 11th of april 2020 so i can uh, uh, i am very glad to uh, uh, say inform that so i have been an author of this particular notification in uh, the eia 2020 and which was uh, put for the comments of the public uh, during the 2020 so coming to the uh, actual the subject uh, so that eia so basically it is an assessment of impact on the environment by any developmental projects including a mining project so how it has got impact on the different attributes of the environment like air water soil ice and all biological and social uh, aspects so this impact uh, has to be uh, measured on the based on the certain base so that is called as a baseline situation so collection of baseline situation is a scientific uh, uh, activity 
So where we need to collect the data in respect of air, water, and soil, nice and land quality, qualitatively, quantitatively, uh, from the uh, for a period of a one season or a for a period of a year, based on the requirement of the uh, project and proposal. So basically, this baseline has to be carried. So what is the level of the surrounding environment before the project commences? So this base baseline is collected in terms of the quality, quantity, reliability, and accessibility for water, soils, air, environmental health, flora and fauna, and other special ecosystems based on the project specific requirements. Coming to the where actually the, this particular environment clearances do require. So for all projects and activities, uh, all new projects, expansion and modernization of the projects and change in the product mix in the existing manufacturing units. So though all the projects and activities means those projects and activities which were listed in the schedule to this notification do require not all everything on the um, board. So it is the projects which are listed in the schedule about 40 types of the projects and activities were listed. Of course, I will give some idea in the subsequent slides. So these are the broader sectors which were covered in the schedule like mining, extraction of natural resources and power generation, primary processing, mineral production, the manufacturing and fabrication, material processing, service sector, physical infrastructure, building and construction areas. So I can say uh, that SIMFER is a very much uh, um, uh, associated with the sector 1, sector 2, sector 3, even sector 7 also. So one, two, about four sectors, broad sectors are covered and uh, I think you have already rendering your services for these particular sectors. So these are the stages that have been uh, involved in the EC process, basically the screening, scoping, preparation of draft EIA, EMP. The screening is nothing but whether to uh, say categorization of the project, whether it is a category A or B. So in the category B also, whether it is a very small earth bulb. So basically the screening is based on the pollution potential, whether it is a uh, potential is very high or low. So based on that, it has been categorized and its process has been defined. Uh, the SOS, uh, SOPs are available for the respective categories. The scoping is a process of uh, prescribing the terms of, scope, uh, terms of references. And these terms of references are uh, uh, useful, uh, useful for preparation of EIA EMP because that EIA EMP has to be prepared in consonance with the terms of references. Mm -hmm. How be it, the no uh, terms of reference are required for the category B2 projects. So these are very small projects like mining of minor mineral less than 5 hectares is a term comes under the B2 category. The subsequent stages on preparation of draft EIA EMP, the public consultation is required. So this is a, this has got the multi two components. One is the uh, public hearing, physical hearing at the site or its close proximity, and inviting responses in writing. So basically, this has two components. One is in the physical hearing, and one is in the written uh, obtaining the responses in written form. Then appraisal will happen by the expert appraisal committee. I think most of your scientists, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the either member in the our central committee or even the state level committees also uh, for the mining appraisal of mining projects and different other uh, developmental projects. Then recommendatory body. So basically the, this uh, expert appraisal committee is a recommendatory body which is a technical in nature. So on, based on the recommendations by the expert appraisal committee, so that the regulatory authority so for the purpose of category A, that the ministry uh, will be treated as a regulatory authority. For the purpose of category B, the state level environmental impact assessment is treated as a regulatory authority. So which is a replica to the, uh, the ministry, the function of the ministry. This uh, particular CA has been constituted, as I said, in the section 3.3 of the Environment Protection Act. So they have got the empowered to um, uh, delegate the functions of this ministry for grant of the environment clearance in respect of category B projects. Coming to uh, the categorization, whether it is a big big projects or small projects based on the pollution potential. So broadly it is classified into category A and B. Uh, so the B has been further divided into the B1 and B2. So uh, whosoever it is and whatever the category it may be, so it has to come to the uh, registered. The project proponent has to make an application in the Parvesh portal 
and subsequently in case of category a so it will be referred to the expert appraisal committee and the based on the recommendations of the ministry uh, will take the decision whether to approve or not the green nod will be given by the ministry so the examples under this category is more than 100 hectares of mining greater than 500 megawatt of uh, thermal power plant greater than and equal to 200 TPD of sponsoring. So basically the categorization has been prescribed basic, uh, on the basis of the threshold value that has also been prescribed in the schedule to the notification. Whereas category B1, so less than 100 hectares and uh, decision not will be given by the state level environmental impact assessment authority. In case of category B2, the process remains same, but uh, here the public consultation and uh, preparation of uh, EIA may not be required. In this particular, a general condition will play a, uh, a role where, so there is a, suppose that particular project is located or proposed to be international or national boundary, then it will be turned to a category A. Uh, the, any uh, B category proposal, it is prote uh, <coughs> proposed to be near to the protected area, or critically polluted area, or eco-sensitive area. So, because of the significance, the function of the location and environmental vulnerability comes into the picture. So, the uh, project B will turn as a category A. Like that, so different case scenarios may come into the picture like coal mining, non-coal mining, riverbed mining, coal washeries and mineral beneficiation, then integrated projects like uh, where the within the mine lease area there may be a mineral beneficiation there may be a thermal power plant like that integrated components and uh, integrated proposals may also come and a significance has to be made for a mining projects within the one kilometer from the protected area because it is a prohibited uh, the mining is has been prohibited in the uh, both protected area as well as within one kilometer by the supreme court so coming to the process, uh, so for the category A projects, the uh, application will be received in the form one and the term, uh, so terms of differences uh, the scoping will be prescribed by an expert appraisal committee. So based on the scope that has been defined, uh, draft EIA EMP will be prepared. So this has to be prepared by a, uh, accredited agencies. Uh, so where the technical inputs or scientific inputs are really required for uh, preparation of this EIA. Then this draft EIA will be placed before the public for uh, receiving their response and comments, suggestions and objections uh, uh, in both in the written form as well as the uh, physical hearing process. So this will be carried by the uh, state uh, pollution control boards. So they will be facilitating and it will be chaired by the district administrator. Including this, uh, the concerns raised in the public consultation, then final EIA EMP has, will be prepared. That final EIA EMP will be submitted either to the ministry or to the state uh, impact assessment authority based on the, as per the category as the case may be uh, in a form two. So that will be again referred to the uh, EAC either at the central level or at the state or UT level based on the category. Then. A technical deliberation will happen based on the recommendation made by this expert appraisal committee, then grant a rejection by the regulatory authority. Uh, so in case of category A, uh, the ministry, in category B, the state level impact assessment authority uh, will take the decision. For category B2 projects, so basically here the application along with the EMP, there is no EIA component, the only uh, the pre-feasibility uh, addended with uh, the management plan, environmental management plan will be sufficient for this. So it will be referred to the appraisal committee, then grant a rejection by the state environmental impact assessment authority. So earlier it was delegated even at the district level, but presently that particular uh, authority is under subjudice. So now it is not functioning because of the NGT order, so which was pronounced in 2018. In this particularly, uh, the takeaway in this particular is there is no EIA and no public hearing. So however, certain uh, uh, the notes are there. So whenever in case of absence of the CIA, so that those proposals will be entertained by the central level and certain projects where uh, for the uh, strategic purpose are there, so certain exemptions were given for small projects, the public consultation was given, so which was available in the respective clauses of the EIA notification. Basically coming to this uh, particular EIA EMP, 
so the generic structure is looks like this uh, the introduction then project description the uh, description of environment and anticipated environmental impacts and mitigation measures the analysis of alternative sites the technology and site that has to be made then environmental monitoring so this is in chapter 6 chapter 7 that additional studies will be there project benefits will be there environmental cost benefit analysis has to be made then in chapter 10 that uh, mp uh, emp will be there then summary and conclusion will be normally given uh, given in the chapter 11 and chapter 12 in the disclosure of consultants here so that uh, i want to just elaborate on the procedure that is been prescribed in the notification for public consultation basically it has got the two components so the one is the physical hearing and second one is the <coughs> uh, uh, receiving the response or inviting the response in the written form then notice has to be made the uh, in the mode of advertisement for a uh, period of uh, 30 days notice has to be given with uh, specifying the date and venue uh, in a uh, national uh, daily newspapers and as well as in the regional vernacular languages also it has to be presided by the district magistrate but however not below the rank of uh, additional district magistrate that has been prescribed in the notification and the representative of state pollution control boards will super supervise and facilitate the hearing process so with all these process stages so the it is a time bound process that has been prescribed in the notification 30 days for the terms of reference even standard tar will be issued within 24 hours so which is an independent after that the uh, tar will be prescribed to the uh, the project proponent and project proponent has to carry out the baseline studies then uh, further preparation of eia emp also then once it is received to the uh, uh, receives to the regulatory authority so appraisal has to be completed within 60 days and grant or rejection has to be conveyed within 45 days so total 105 days is required for the decision of ec uh, so this is the timeline that has been prescribed in the notification so the instant tar uh, uh, component and this particular uh, aspect has been introduced very in the recent past so that wherever the standard process have already been devised for the different sectors so these standard tars are uh, will be prescribed in case of expansion uh, and the projects which are located in the industrial estates where there is no requirement for alternative site examination so coming to the uh, the role so since we are all, already talking that the what is the, the procedure that is involved in the eia emp so uh, let us talk so where that uh, simfer and the the scientist uh, the can contribute so how that inputs are really required for the environmental impact assessment so basically here that impact assessment is the one chapter where really the scientific analysis is required the risk assessment is uh, the another one where the scientific analysis is required planning of mitigation and measures the planning of uh, retrofits the strategy for the post project monitoring and environmental monitoring program so these are the components where really required so i can uh, i have i try to give one uh, example so for the illustration purpose i have taken an example uh, of uh, one of the projects uh, 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 where i worked earlier so for example this is the mine uh, so which is located uh, near to a uh, uh, river godavari so which is about 4 uh, uh, to 5 kilometers uh, and also has got the involvement of the forest land also then non forest land and surrounding by a certain habitats so if it is so and for example in the different stages it is uh, uh, say envisaged so the excavation in this particular process like in the initial so like this and in the first year so these are these are the different stages of the development of uh, the mine uh, so which is proposed and taken from the mining plan and for, uh, of course so, so this is the mine closure that has been envisaged in the mining plan so for this particular purpose so what is the impact for say let the let, let you take a example of the air so for the each of the operations for the drilling blasting excavation dosing and transportation so these are the activities that are involved so how we have to uh, estimate the emissions 
and on estimation of emissions so the major concern is how it will be impact on the surrounding people so who are the recipients and the recipient uh, at the recipient so what will be the concentration whether it is harmful whether it is exceeding the standards or not or below the permissible standards that has to be evaluated that has to be an exercise that has to be carried by a scientific community uh, to evaluate and to take the decision by the regulatory authority so for example some uh, models uh, like air mod and uh, uh, your iscst3 model may be uh, normally utilized for that estimation so once it is estimated then the ground level concentrations the glc values uh, so how it will be there with along with the isoplates can be uh, get from the uh, this particular model so that we can also evaluate the impact of the uh, impact of the project then you can see so that base level then incremental value incremental value and the, the, the again is the standard whether it is a permissible also then can be uh, taken from this uh, uh, table so another thing that also uh, i would like to just uh, inform that how we can also utilize the uh, uh, different modeling uh, aspects for the evaluation of the impacts so for the uh, ground uh, you all know the mining Uh, say uh, touches the aquifers so then uh, how it has, uh, it will have the impact on the aquifer as well as in the phreatic surfaces so these are the trends which has been observed in the during the preliminary that is the baseline studies so with this uh, the phreatic um, uh, surface study so these are the isoplates that was drawn in the pre monsoon season as well as in the post monsoon season for this uh, see uh, so that impact has been just for the purpose of illustration how it uh, actually happens you all know that the that, uh, that there is the impervious layer so that uh, <clears throat> the cold seams so that has been treated as a impermeable layer so when uh, uh, this is sorry then the cones are formed when the mining is goes deeper and deeper so it will not extend in a lateral one so it extends in the vertical and series of cones will be formed one below the other so the cumulative uh, impact is a not the arithmetic sum so it will be a logarithmic sum uh, so that the impact is simply uh, uh, is not doubled by just by increasing the depth of the slab so this can be arrived by using the equations like sickert's and think you might be more expertise in this so like the team equation for the different scenarios where the multiple the aquifers and multiple uh, uh, impermeable layers are present this particular equation normally used so let us take one the, this particular example of the mine so they have uh, the, uh, this can be calculated what will be the uh, assumed area of influence so where actually the ground water really uh effects so that we can have we can take the measures say for example here mallam padu village is there so there is a shivlingapuram village is there so that there the uh, rain water harvesting structures or other modes of mitigating measures has to be planned during the course of mining but it is not a simple um, that so here it is it is always has got the function of the rate of production as well as in the stage of development so how this stage of development is there so try uh, try to make in a modeling of 3d modeling so where this mine has been <coughs> mining area and a sub water basin has been divided into the grids and made an active cells and uh, passive cells uh, so that uh, a framework geological framework model uh, has been created in this particular one so that the how this uh, <laughs> impact on the computed ground water table in that particular basin has been Uh, calculated through a mod flow, uh, wherein this uh, uh, try to correct through a observatory head well with the correction factors also, so that in the each stage how the impact will be sliding in the different mining surrounding areas. So initially, uh, say you can uh, see the impact here, and subsequently it is moving like this in the different area uh, the stages of mining. so ultimately at the 18th year or 20th year it will be it has got the maximum but to the 20th year i think this is the, uh, the final one in the reclamation phase suddenly uh, so it comes down because of that the reclamation activity that will be taken care 
uh, that will be uh, compensate the aquifer researching all so this is the reason here this particular the outcome and that uh, the take away from this particular study is at each of the stage so which of the villages are uh, impacting and the at the those villages where the which activity which uh, uh, the mitigative measure precautionary measure has to be taken that has to be designed in a very scientific way so that is the intent to show this particular uh, uh, modeling for the purpose so it is not a qualitative uh, this thing so eia is a one a technical tool so that is uh, scientifically utilized for um, assessment of the impact as well as for the mitigation measures here you can see uh, say different uh, technologies that can be so uh, uh, temporal uh, changes in the uh, your green belt and other green cover so that can be uh, assessed over a period of time so in the mining lease area so in the particular uh, the mine lease area so how that uh, it has changed from 2000 to 2014 so try to show here so this is uh, the scientific inputs part of you I will do. Okay. Then, uh, say this is uh, again. Uh, so I am coming to the administrative part of the uh, the ministry. So we encountered, uh, we uh, noted some gap analysis in this particular process. So there are the policy bottlenecks. There are the uh, say uh, decision on citing of EAC. So there is a discretionary power which is, so which is really hindering the process. Then uh, the letharginess and. Uh, 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 say <clears throat> recklessness of the, the project proponents also sometimes leading uh, to a delay in the process like by incomplete uh, submission of incomplete uh, EC application then delay in the public hearing process so this is always a function of this local uh, line uh, <clears throat> local uh, uh, situations then delay in the EIA process then incomplete reports so these are the list of such uh, uh, bottlenecks that has been in, uh, noticed during the EC process, which is really uh, taking the time for the grant of environment clearances. For this, we try to make some reforms, like uh, by delegation. Delegation is a one tool, so where we can delegate the work so that we can speed up the process. Then recategorization of projects. So, like uh, in the recent past, the hydrocarbon exploration of hydrocarbons has been recategorized from category A to category. B2, so that the process has become the very speed. So then standards, uh, so, uh, when we make the things standard, so then also it will be a clarity. There will not be any ambiguity and there will not be a, um, the con consistency in that one. So in that particular process, then uh, TORS and the EC conditions has been already standardized. Then a facility of collection, uh, collecting the data in a flexible, irrespective of the status of application, the project proponent can may, uh, collect the data well in advance uh, for the preparation of EAA, EMP. Then another uh, the major reform that e-governance, we have completely automated the process through a Parivesh portal. So then validity of TOR at one go also, then is one, uh, another step that has been taken, then streamlining like that. So special dispensation time to time so wherever and whenever it is required so every time uh, so in order to uh, facilitate the uh, proponents and all so the ministry is very much proactive and taking a reforms in a timely manner like uh, aligning the ea notification with mmdr notification in 2000 uh, so that module has already been on live uh, so far just for registration and auto transfer of mining leads to the successful bidders then violation is also one of the uh, one uh, one of the topics so which is normally uh, say comes with the picture so it means any uh, any activity that has been not taken uh, the environment clearance or commenced without prior ec is treated as a violation so there are the different case scenario that may happen so somebody may take the uh, mining plan approval but they the, uh, if they didn't take the environment clearance so that is also not acceptable so whatever the uh, requirements mandate and requirements and our work uh, so that has to be complied you all know uh, for in case of mining projects about 21 types of clearances and uh, the permissions or consents uh, 
uh, that is required either at the state level or central level or at uh, the <coughs> local level so unless and until all those are in place so it will not be treated as a legal so any of that so that will be uh, uh, treated as a violation so to address so some of the cases have come earlier office memorandums were issued so which was passed by the ngt so which was not stand before the legal scrutiny then subsequently came up with the notification with the one time window a time window has been given for 6 months even that so many people have missed the bus uh, of the, this time window and subsequently <coughs> Uh, the several representations have come uh, to uh, apprise those uh, some of the violation cases which were occurred opposed to the notification also ministry of course have given some sop but it has been challenged again because uh, the, this is not a regular practice that has to be encouraged so once that the mandated mandated requirement is there that has to be followed so that was the comment uh, or the observations of the court and tribunals Uh, so that it was not stand in the uh, legal scrutiny however so you can see the there are the, i try to give so what are the uh, different principles uh, that has been observed by the different courts and tribunals basically they have come on the pollution pay principle and principles of proportionality and there should not be any ex post facto mechanism that is already given in that uh, act itself so these are the observations made the made by the court and for that so there was an sop that has been given uh, so where the particular activity is legal legally permissible so why can't be uh, say treated and to bring into the ambit of the notification and all so try to give that uh, the sop in this particular uh, the uncognizance of violations and who comes for the as a sumoto uh, uh, for regularizing and uh, uh, for uh, uh, removing the violations and all central e governance also taken uh, so to take the transparent and expeditious process of course it was also a direction in the uh, of the supreme court in the case of lafarge uh, so where uh, the apex court has directed to make it a transparent and expeditious process then gs platform has to be prepared and placing documents on the public domain so that wherever there is a transparency then there will be a, uh, accountability so that was the funda and uh, the as a first step so in the 2014 we started receiving an application in the e uh, online uh, mode however in a the due course of time so it has been transformed into a uh, say automatic portal a small video is there to explain actually what uh, the exactly this particular portal because so this is the also uh, very much required uh, for the projects that may be dealing by uh,
Thank you. Uh, so this particular uh, uh, online portal has been launched uh, by the Honorable Prime Minister in the 10th of August 2018. So I am very much uh, uh, glad and uh, uh, the privilege to inform that this has been uh, say from the since beginning it has been developed, designed and developed by uh, the, the majorly contributed from my side. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it is always a privilege to have such a, uh, uh, some system which is already in place in the government by the, with our contribution. So th th there is an uh, accomplishments through this particular project. So earlier the, the, the date uh, average number of days uh, so that has been come down drastically. Now it is less than 100 in double digit. So which was a commitment to the cabinet and the PMO. So which uh, we are well uh, well within the uh, the targets and. Uh, but you know that uh, so th this COVID has everywhere so that administration now the technology leveraging on the technology that has to be adopted multiple ways government has to be minimized. So uh, now it has been thought of that uh, uh, so the existing Parvesh can be uh, the upgraded uh, to a level so where the com complete end to end process of all the clearances that has been administered by this ministry can't be made into the automatic process and uh, completely faceless. So with that idea, so now we found, uh, we made an analysis of the gap uh, gaps which are there in the current portal. So like uh, the KYC was not there then, uh, so that uh, forms were not talking to each other. There is no validation through the GIS uh, layers and all. So whatever the data that has been submitted by the project proponent, uh, is just relied. There was no verification mechanism. The inbuilt and the root engines were not made inbuilt in the particular portal. So there is also some uh, the administrative process like uh, the uh, the payments and the uh, collection of the digital gateways uh, for collect uh, for submission of the payments which are applicable for the respective clearances is also not there in the present one. So therefore. So this particular uh, the uh, version now we uh, want to upgrade to a uh, 2.0 uh, by um, making it a process transformation and a technological transformation and domain uh, knowledge intervention. Basically, uh, so emerging technologies want to integrate like AI, the IOTs and the artificial uh, uh, then uh, different uh, the technology GIS interface. So that want to integrate so that the uh, complete system can be more uh, transparent, expeditious and can deliver the complete modeling. So these are the building blocks that has been envisaged at the each of the level. So at the state level, then registration will be there. Know your approval. So this is the GIS based interface will be there. So just by uploading the KML, so that uh, the uh, that particular activity requires the what type of the clearances so whether it is required or not so rule uh, rule engine will be integrated in this particular by jas so this is basically developed through the jas and mis interface then clearance management will be there post the clearances then compliance also will be captured through a um, uh, online mode so that the profile of a uh, the entity can be monitored through a system so there will be analytics so that red flagging will be there so the compliance behavior can be captured so that uh, uh, so how we can take the uh, action against the non compliant also this all of course, will be utilized for when we have the ample data, when we data converted to the knowledge that can be utilized for the research uh, and the policy making also. So there are the different key differentiator that I would like to um, uh, project here. So entity validation will be there, no your approval will be there, decision support system that we want to integrate then rationalization uh, so then uh, in order to remove the redundancy and uh, uh, single source of truth so all the clearances will be integrated in this like that so the campa uh, so that compensatory fr station module also will be integrated in this then damage assessment npv calculations so whatever the components and sub components uh, so that, uh, that are uh, involved in the process uh, processing of the different clearances will be tried to made it more automated, more um, digital way so that 
for example the eia emp also we tried to made it more templatized uh, and also that xml module also so that the capturing of the data in a very digestible form that can be read uh, uh, read by the machine and also utilized for the analytics so that's how that with that intent so these are the this, uh, different component that has been envisaged of course uh, so though there is an intent to uh, of this when the, the completely cannot be transformed to the content so there is always some subjectivity will be there uh, because of that that eia uh, process can be always a different for every project and it is a very specific to a project to project so we can say that it, though it is a project uh, specific but uh, in case of the process and that uh, the generic structure that can be standardized also that effort has already been tried to made and we are continually trying to make it made it uh, more efficient so these are the envisaged modules that will be there in that one so even legal repository and everything will be there so coming to the eia 2020 also the so lot of uh, the exercise has been made and policy research has also been made so where how uh, uh, see this um, uh, wherever there is a ambiguity is there try to remove wherever redundancy is there that is also tried in this one and there are uh, they try to uh, leverage on the technology and encourage the modernization and build uh, to encourage also best technologies uh, that can be uh, come into the process so these the these guiding principles eia 2020 has been captured so the, these are the broad objectives comprehensiveness fast tracking of the small projects and automation uh, the strengthening of monitoring mechanism and validity at one glow bringing the defaulters into the regulatory regime with this uh, ei broad objectives that particular notification has been put for the public comment drafted and gazetted and uh, put for the public comments you all know we received more than 20 lakh comments on this particular one this was a marathon exercise that has been carried out to capture that what is the uh, actually the comments of those particular so the technology uh, the email analysis using the uh, python uh, programming and uh, LD algorithm was used to uh, uh, capture what is the response of the different uh, the public that has been uh, responded against the draft so then uh, the cloud uh, the word cloud technology also been used for the topic mapping with this so we are able to analyze on which of the provisions and what how many what are the number of comment that has been received and what is the uh, uh, intent of those uh, comments so we could able to list out about 60 to 65 only uh, say take away from the 23 lakh comments so this has been also been presently this uh, uh, some uh, court case uh, cases are going on uh, since it is a matter under sub judice so after completion of that so the ministry may take up uh, and any at any point of time this particular notification may see a light of day so these are the basically i try to uh, uh, explain uh, so what is the procedure what is the legal instruments that is uh, really <coughs> They and then what is the process involved? Then what is the technological intervention that can be roped into this particular process? Then the future also and also the try to make it how what is the e-governance that has been uh, presently instrumented for this particular process? With this, uh, I close my session uh, and now the, we can open uh, for the discussion. If at all, if anything is required from my side, so let me stop sharing so that uh, i can be visible if yeah any questions are there are visible? Am I visible? anybody can ask questions to the speaker questions please Okay. Since there are no questions, let us uh, 
let, let us go to the next step. Thank you for uh, uh, your wonderful presentation, Mr. Sharad, on a pertinent topic of environmental impact assessment. A big round of applause for the outstanding work carried out by you, sir. Thank you. Thank great you. Very much. Thank you. It's great to hear that your valuable contributions for the draft of environmental impact assessment notification 2020, which was issued by Government of India, is a backbone of several reforms in environmental clearance process in the country. And we are very sure your brainchild, Parivesh, is going to be the game changer in environmental impact assessment. Thank you, sir, once again. Uh, this is the end of this session. And I request our director, sir, to give opening remarks for the, for the next lecture. Dr. Ramu, I enjoyed the, the lecture delivered by our colleague from Father Saab. And really, it has a lot of data and everyone must have uh, you know, reached their knowledge. So, from my side also, sir, a lot of thanks to you for your time. And now the next speaker, Alexander. So I welcome you, sir, because I see you were one hour before also you were connected at uh, Indian time 2.25 and it is now going to be 3.30. Uh, so since last one hour you are connected with us. So I appreciate your patience and I welcome you. Kindly deliver the class. Ramu, sir, introduction is required. Dr. Ramlu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, okay. sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Neil Ratan, to give introduction of the speaker, Dr. Alexander Stroms. Neil Ratan, please. Thank you very much, sir. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Alexander Storm. Sir, Professor Storm is an eminent scientist in the field of landslide-related phenomenon and rock and which is research. Worldwide, Sir, Professor Alexander Storm graduated from Moscow State University in 1975, and he studied large rock slides and performed field value seismological and seismotectonic investigation in Pamir, Garhwal Himalaya, Western and Eastern Seyan, Far East of Asia, Mongolia, Northern Sudan, and collected worldwide database on seismic surface rupture. That includes more than 300 parameters. He also performed detailed studies of morphological and structural feature of rock slide and rock avalanche in Central Asia and compiled a database of large scale rock slide in the Central Asia Asian region, about 1000 cases. He also published a book on rock slide and avalanches of Central Asia, which is published in Elsevier 2018. He also worked on hazard related to active fault that cross pipelines in Eastern Siberia. He is a member of Russian group of International Association of Engineering Geologists and Joint Technical Committee 1 on Landslide and Engineered Slope. He is an associate editor of prestigious journal Landslide. Currently, he holds key position as a chief expert of Geodynamic Research Center, Moscow, Russia and an adjunct professor, Shanghai University, visiting professor, SKLJP, China. Sir, I request to you for your lecture. Sir, Dice, is over to you. Alexander, sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, do you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to congratulate your institute with this excellent jubilee 
and wish you every success in all your efforts in future. Now let me, uh, I will try to share my screen. Yes. Do you see the screen? Hello. We can, yes, sir, we can see the screen. Okay, then let's start. So I will uh, discuss problem uh, of can you, rock. Sir, can you please uh, make? Sir, please can you make it full screen? Yeah, it is a uh, full screen on my computer. Slide mode. Can you make it slide mode? It is uh, on my computer. Ah, maybe let's. Uh, like this is better. Sorry. Sorry, do you see my screen? Yes, sir, we can see, but uh, can you make it uh, in, in, uh, can, you, can you make it in slide mode? Yeah, before it was slide mode. Now it is oh. slide mode on my computer. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. You can okay. So, so, thank you. I will talk about rock avalanches, one of the most hazardous types of landslides. And I must say, I must say that... Um, uh, such phenomena can uh, take place also on the high slope slopes of deep open pit mines that can behave as natural slopes. A correct assessment of hazards and risks provided by these phenomena requires their comprehensive classification considering rock avalanche initiation, its motion mechanism and interrelation of moving debris with the topographic and mechanical conditions of the travel uh, path. Yeah. Uh, slide is not changing. Uh, slides are changing on my computer. Uh, sir, click on bottom right. Just a moment. Let me. Uh, now it is changing. Don't not change. It is changing now. Microsoft. Uh huh. Uh, now let's try again. Sorry. It is okay, sir. Now it is changing. It's changing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, it is okay. No, okay. I think it might be some connection uh, problem. Okay. It changes. Do you see the? Yes, sir. We can see. Okay. So let's start with main characteristics of rock avalanches. First of all, most of rock avalanches have such dual or triple structure with coarse bouldery carapace, intensively fragmented body faces, <coughs> and sometimes we can identify comminuted basal faces. Most inf informative are those rock avalanches that originate on the slopes composed of different lithological types of rocks, especially of those with variable colors Comparison of the mutual position of rock types in the source area and of debris originated from these rocks in the resultant rock slide body allows detailed reconstruction of rock slide motion. It is one of the best examples. The Kokomeren rock avalanche in central Tianshan, Kyrgyzstan, about more than one cubic kilometer in volume. It 
originated from this head scarf, and here is the giant body. Here we can see <clears throat> bouldery carapace here and here, and intensively crushed inner part on C and D. Moreover, we can, on the opposite bank of the river, we can see that crushed meta sediments, these gray units. Yes? Sir, uh, we will uh, take uh, slide control from here. Shall, shall we take slide control from here? Because it is not okay. coming from your so side. I will, um, so I will um, stop my... Uh, let's try. Yes, sir. We are trying. I stop my screen. So just a minute, we are working on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now you can see the screen. Yes, yes, great. Next, please. Ah, can I... Can you uh, change this slide? Yes, once more. Next, please. Next. Several more. Next. I will say when you should stop. Sorry. Next one. Yes, you can see these gray and these uh, pink units composed of different lithologies that traveled more than two kilometers from their original position across the Kakomaran River Valley, but did not mix nevertheless. Next, please. Yes, another example. It is the so-called lower Aral rock avalanche composed of Paleozoic granite. It had scarp is on top of the uh, summit. Next, please. Yes, it traveled here, split, being split in, on the way. And then you can see in this outcrop near uh, elevation mark 1,520 meters that we have very coarse bouldery carapace. Next, please. Yes, and one more. Yes, and it is underlined by very intensively fragmented material. What is in? Interesting that originally it is the same type of rock, uh, red granite. Nevertheless, you can see big difference between upper uh, faces and lower fragmented body faces. Next, please. Here we can see another example. It is the famous Usoi rock slide in Pamir that originated in 1911. The la and formed the world's largest natural dam. And the lake, Sares Lake, which can be seen here, dark body. And we can see the top of this uh, giant body is composed of huge block, more than half kilometer um, uh, in size, with remaining bedding and intensive uh, fr uh, fracturing in the opposite direction. It moved probably like an iceberg on top of the intensively fragmented inner part. Next, please. 
What is interesting, that coarse, bouldery, carapace, next please, can be just one boulder thick. Here we can see the uh, dam of the so-called Great Almaty Lake, near former capital of Kazakhstan. And from top, it is composed of huge blocks and boulders of gneiss. But now let's see the next slide. Yes, and one more, please. And we can see that from top, it is, compo it is a small quarry. From top, we, there are huge boulders on, but this carapace is only one boulder thick. Just below, we have intensively fragmented same material. Next, please. It is grain size composition of several rock avalanches from uh, Central Asia and Caucasus, where we can see grain size composition of the body faces, which are extremely fine, and, uh, sorry, basal faces, and of the body faces, which is a little bit more coarser, but anyway, intensively fragmented. Next, please. Here, we can see a good example of preservation of the host rock massive macrostructure. This very large rock avalanche that originated from the head scarp with top at 3,835 meters above sea level, formed huge body where we can <coughs> clearly see several zones composed of different types of rocks. Next, please. And what is very interesting, one more, please. Yes, that in this body, especially in this, say, brown zone composed of originally bedrock, we can trace each layer at a distance of more than 500 meters, sometimes up to one kilometer. Each layer can be identified. Next, please. Yes, similar phenomena can be seen at this sm rather small rock avalanche in Chinese Tianshan, where we can identify again each layer in the rock avalanche body, and we can correlate it with some layers in the source zone despite all material was intensively fragmented. Next, please. Same uh, preservation of st internal structure can be seen in the cross section as well. Again, it is Cocomeran rock slide. And we see that rocks that originally uh, rest at, on top of this source zone, they form the upper part, upper layer of the <clears throat> rock avalanche deposits. And there is a huge block on the right upper part of gra cr fragmented granite. And below we can see intensively fragmented uh, debris resting over alluvial uh, terrace. Next, please. Absence of mixing of different lithologies involved in rock slope failure indicate that style of rock avalanches motion should be characterized as a laminar-like granular flow. Next, please. Let's now uh, come to multi-stage classification based on the updated Varnas classification of landslides proposed by Ulrich Hunger, Serge Leroyal, and Luciano Piccarelli. Next, please. And one more. Next, and one more. Yes, and one more, please. So, <clears throat> we will discuss these types of um, landslides, landslides presented in this classification. Actually, a uh, rock avalanche is a flow type of landslides, while uh, initial types of slope failure are these 
topple slide uh, slide uh, planar rotational wedge compound irregular. Next, please. Yes, here we can see initial mechanisms of slope failure. Next, please. Yes, these. And when these slope failure originate, it can either transform into flow slide, into rock avalanche, or could remain as the same sliding mechanism. So we can identify planar rock slides and we can identify planar rock avalanches that originate as planar slide and then convert into rock avalanches. Same with other types of landslides. Next, please. Yes, and next, please. Here is an example of such transformation. It is the sliding surface of lower aral, um, uh, lower aral, sorry, planar rock slide that originated along bedding in these uh, coarse bedded neogene conglomerates. Next, please. Yes. Here we can see that on top of its body, the uh, uh, source zone is on the top right, and on top of this body, we see huge blocks of these conglomerates. But now let's, next please. But below, we see the homogeneous mass of crushed conglomerates that represent now the uh, mixture of pebbles, and uh, sand and silt and um, my, uh, small debris. Next, please. Very interesting example. The Ornok rotational rock slide in central Tian Shan, in Kyrgyzstan. Next, please. Yes, it is its huge head scarp, about one and a half kilometer wide, circular in shape, Next, please. Uh, it is a uh, rock slide occurred from Paleozoic massive, uh, thrusted over neogene red beds, these yellow units. Next, please. On here, we have huge rotated block of both Paleozoic rocks, neogene conglomerate, and fold zone dividing them. Next, please. But in front of it, its frontal part, converted into very impressive, uh, let's say, stratified rock avalanche. Next, please. Here we can see number one is Paleozoic rotated block. Number two, our neogene red beds rotated together with this block. But number three is rock avalanche that originated in front of this rotated block. And we can see that each lithology form each separate, say, layer. Next, please. And here we can see in bigger scale boundary, the transition boundary from rotated block and rock avalanche. We can even trace a layer of scree that originally rested at the foot of this slope. Next, please. Very good example of wedge rock avalanche. We clearly see wedge sl rock slope failure with well-preserved planes. And next, please. And it is a head scarp. Next, please. And it is the body. And we can see how uh, long it was. And we see big blocks on top of these deposits. Next, please. Yes, it is the famous 1949 Haid rock avalanche in Tajikistan, the most one of the most disastrous 
uh, rock slope failures all over the world. It <coughs> occurred during the earthquake with magnitude about 7.5, 7.4. Here it was, its giant had scarp and about 100 million cubic meters of gneiss and granite rushed down um, and trained some uh, loss uh, that was uh, on uh, the slopes of this valley and finally spread over this valley across and it buried the town. And several thousands of people were buried uh, by this rock avalanche. And it can be classified as irregular rock slide, irregular rock avalanche, because originally it was irregular rock slide. Next, please. So, <clears throat> the, the proposed multi-stage classification helps to distinguish between rock slides retaining initial mechanism up to their motion halt and rock avalanches, extremely mobile granular flows of fragmented rocks. However, rock avalanches in turn, they can behave in quite different ways depending on their relationships with the terrain and substrate and on peculiarities of their motion mechanisms. And such differences can be described within the next multi-level classification based on morphological criteria. Next, please. So, there are several uh, criteria. First is confinement. We can identify unconfined, frontally confined, and laterally confined types. Next, please. Other classification criteria are a long way debris distribution, uh, where we can identify primary jumping and secondary types, and debris motion directivity uh, that include unidirectional and deflected types. Next, please. Confinement. It is obvious that confinement predetermine rock slide and rock avalanche motion at a large extent. Next, please. As I told already, we can select unconfined, frontally and laterally confined rock avalanches. Next, please. Uh, some, yeah, sometimes combination of different types can be observed as well. I will just stop on it. Next, please. Okay, it is about two and a half kilometer long unconfined monodirectional rock avalanche in eastern Tianshan in China. Its body width is almost constant and even narrowing, and it is more or less cl close, similar to the width of the headscarf base. Next, please. And another type, unconfined but fan-shaped Imaki rock avalanche, very long, about 16 kilometer long rock avalanche at the foot of the eastern Pamir in China. It originated in the along head of the narrow valley, traveled first as lateral one, and then formed this giant fan-shaped body. Next, please. It is the unconfined isometric Ajailao rock avalanche in Tianshan in uh, Kyrgyzstan. It originated from the slope with a top of uh, marked by 4,005 meters. We have its rather big but narrow, nevertheless limited base of the uh, source zone and a uh, white uh, dashed line marks the original shape of this isometric, we can say, uh, uh, pancake shape body. Next, please. Frontally confined rock avalanches also can be divided into several subtypes. Here we see the compact rock avalanche, this um, uh, very distinct body at the base of the high head scar. Next, please. And here we have widened Yashilkul rock avalanche in Pamir. 
It collapsed from the head scarp with top at 4,730 meters. But when it uh, collided with the opposite slope, it spread up and down valley for more than four kilometers. Next, please. And here we can see the photo of its boundary zone where we can identify main zone composed of blocks of angular big blocks of gneiss and outer zone about 150 meter wide composed of moraine material that was bulldozed and thrown away outside uh, this boundary and the same uh, zone composed of moraine material is marked by black arrows in front of this body next please here we can see laterally confined rock avalanche that was about six and a half kilometer long. It started from the head scarp marked by these two um, elevation marks, traveled down slope and left distinct trim lines at 2930 and 2780 meter, much above the uh, resultant uh, level of debris and then when it entered another valley it turned it and then but turned and uh, followed for about four kilometers down uh, this valley next please combined type it is again Haït rock avalanche next please yes it originated from this very deep head scarp and then moved as laterally confined rock avalanche. But when it entered the wider valley, it converted into unconfined fence-shaped rock avalanche marked by this red line. Next, please. What is important? That confinement affect mechanics of debris motion. Type 1 correspond to unconfined and to laterally confined rock avalanches. Type 2 correspond to frontally confined rock avalanches. Their motion mechanics was similar up to point A. Next, please. But after passing this point, uh, these cases uh, marked by 1, their motion depends on basal friction and on internal processes in moving debris, like fragmentation, fragmentation, initial internal friction, heating, etc. Next, please. But um, type two, besides all these processes, it moved against gravity upslope, so it is additional mechanics type of. Um, mechanism that is absent in type 1. So that is why analysis of correlations between rock avalanche source parameters, volume, height drop and run out or affected area should be performed for rock avalanches with different confinement conditions separately rather than for the entire data set. I will show some examples later. Next please. Another type of classification criteria is classification based on the along way debris distribution. Next, please. This criterion allows classifying highly mobile rock avalanches regardless of the initial slope failure type and of the con confinement. Next, please. The along way debris distribution reflects somehow the conditions of transformation from the initial block slide motion to the rock avalanche flow like motion. Next, please. Here we can see basic types of rock avalanches classified according to this cl classification criteria. Primary rock avalanches in unconfined or laterally confined conditions and in frontally confined conditions. In both cases, material moved as far as it could. Jumping rock avalanche that really jump, like from a ski jump, 
and two types of secondary rock avalanches. Uh, the uh, first one, well, number three, that is well expressed in cross-section with very distinct boundary between compact and mobile part. And another type, better visible in plan view, when moving material enter sharp narrowing, some bottleneck, and then its part that retain possibility of further mo motion, rush ahead. Next, please. It is a very good example of primary, laterally confined rock avalanche. It originated from the headscarf visible on the top left, but practically all material accumulated here at the distal part of runout. Next, please. Yeah, it moved more than three kilometers and accumulated here, being stopped by sharp bend of this valley uh, slope. Next, please. Another example, also primary rock avalanche, but in frontally confined conditions. Next, please. Look, all material, or most of material, moved again as far as it could. But this time, it had to move upslope. But in both cases, motion was, uh, uh, say, organized in such way that material moved as far as possible. All material. Next, please. Very good example of jumping, Karakungay rock avalanche. Here we see the convex slope of its compact part and avalanche-like portion. Next, please. And here we see the uh, model, how it is formed. Please uh, click uh, several times. Uh, next. Compact part, yes. Mobile, next. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, once, and one more. Yes, thank you. So, what happens when the frontal part of a uh, rather elongated landslide, tailing part, still moves, its effect, it collapses on this frontal part, fluidizes it, mobilizes it, and frontal part is somehow pressed out from the compact part. Next, please. Maybe the most interesting and potentially most hazardous are secondary rock avalanches. Next, please. Next. Yes, yes, and one more. So, no, let's go, okay, let's uh, stay with this. Here is a good example of secondary rock avalanche. Next, please. We have very distinct head scarp from where it collapsed. Next. Then it formed this collapse, compact body. Then something happened in this rock mass and distinct secondary scar originate. And from this next one, rock avalanche, very long one formed. Next, please. And here we will see same example with bottleneck effects. Next, please. The phenomena are something similar, but uh, it occur when rock uh, um, uh, avalanche passes through the sharp narrowing on its way. Next, please. So, uh, I must say that they are extremely mobile and sometimes could have a longer run out run out than the same size rock avalanches that move without such effect. Next, please. Yes, it is one of the very good examples, so-called snake head. But rather small, about six cub million cubic meter in volume only. It originated here, were marked by A. Next, please. Yes, and one more. 
and we can see its head scar. And material, what is interesting, material moved not just down slope, but somehow oblique towards the bottleneck marked by this white circle. Next, please. And one more. And it traveled along this narrow valley up to this uh, distal part, forming very distinct and very impressive distal blade uh, with transverse wavy surface. Traveled for more than two kilometer long with very mm, along rather gentle valley. It indicate extreme mobility of such type of rock avalanches. Next, please. Here is the cartoon illustrating formation of secondary rock avalanches. I expect that they are such um, motion mechanism is ex can be explained by momentum transfer from rapidly decelerating portion of debris to its portion retaining possibility of further motion. Such transfer could occur due to collision with an obstacle or due to entering into bottleneck valley constriction. Next, please. Yeah, it is accelerated downslope motion of the entire body with mass M1 prior to its collision with valley bottom or with opposite slope. Next one, please. Then, such collision occurred, resulting in rapid deceleration and formation of compact body and some momentum transfer. Next, please. And part of debris that retains possibility of further motion is ejected and rushed ahead with uh, additional momentum. Next, please. Yes. And... Uh, it uh, had been proved somehow by statistical analysis of secondary rock avalanches. Next, please. So, one more classification criteria. Debris motion directivity. We can identify unidirectional and deflected types. Next, please. I must say that such division can be applied for jumping and secondary types mainly, and for rock avalanches with frontal and lateral confinement. Next. And I must say that the abrupt change of motion direction provides additional extreme hazard, since such rock avalanches can affect sites that otherwise could be considered as being safe, even if we know that uh, some slope can collapse. Next, please. Here we see the unidirectional chong su rock avalanche. Next, please. It is the initial head scarp. Next. Compact body. Next, please. Secondary scar. And long run out rock avalanche that moved just in the same direction, being laterally confined. Next, please. And it moved totally for more about two and a half kilometers. Next. But here we have deflected Southern Karakungay rock avalanche, formed by about 20 million cubic meter rock slide in granite. Next, please. You can see the distinct head scarp and direction of initial motion. And when it collided with the opposite valley slope, it turned. Next, please. And moved about one and a half kilometer ahead in totally different direction. Next, please. Yes. Here we can, you can see this body. Imagine that if our, say, house would be at the arrowhead of this green arrow, we would consider that we are living in a safe place, even if we expect that failure at a site marked by blue arrow might occur. Next, please. So, these morphological classification criteria 
allow such what I called multi-level multi classification. The first level is rock avalanches classified accord, according to first multi-stage classification. But then, basing on this morphological classification criteria, we can identify several types and subtypes of these rock avalanches. Next, please. Yes, the proposed classification is flexible. Types of rock avalanches selected according to main classification criteria can be considered as subtypes, depending on the purpose and objectives of our research. Next, please. Here, we can say that jumping rock slides can be <coughs> classified as unidirectional and deflected. Secondary can be classified also as unidirectional and deflected while bot secondary bottleneck can be only unidirectional. Next, please. Primary rock avalanches can be unconfined, laterally confined, or frontally confined. They can be um, uh, subdivided according to, uh, depending on our needs in several other types and subtypes. Next, please. So, use of classification for correct rock avalanche mobility characterization and for hazard and risk assessment. These study are not only, let's say, provide us information necessary for a un better understanding of the phenomena, but it can help to, uh, to select parameters that can be used to characterize rock avalanche mobility, such as angle of reach, uh, 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 length, area, and can be used for hazard assessment. Here we are, can compare uh, relationships between runout on the left and angle of reach uh, uh, ratio between high drop and length on the right. Next, please. And we can see that uh, uh, correlation coefficients for the left one, for runout versus volume, is much higher than for uh, uh, relation between angle of reach of volume. It means that use of the left uh, relation uh, correlation uh, can be uh, provide more accurate assessment of the expected hazard. Next, please. Next one. And we can also <clears throat> analyze a uh, re relationship between runout and product of vol uh, volume and high drop, which is somehow proportional to uh, potential energy released during emplacement. And we can see that for frontally confined and for unconfined rock avalanches. These correlation coefficients are even higher, while for laterally con confined rock avalanches, such correlation is very, very weak, practically no correlation. Next one. So, in most of studies, uh, to characterize rock avalanche mobility, researchers use runout or uh, 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 angle of reach. But it appeared that even better parameter is a uh, area affected by rock avalanche, either total affected area that include both head scarp, transition and deposition zone, or area of the deposits. You can see that uh, correlation coefficient, coefficients are very high, about uh, point 0.9 and even higher on the right plot. Next one, please. And the best, the best class, uh, correlation is between product of volume and high drop and affected area. C uh, correlation coefficients for all types of uh, motion of uh, confinement are much above 0.9. So, if we can uh, uh, predict and expect uh, 
potential volume of failure and uh, height of the co slope that might collapse, we can uh, predict area that might would be affected by this uh, failure with high accuracy, high precision. And uh, with it is very simple method. And uh, if we compare with numerical modeling, for which we have to know a lot of input data, which might be not available. Next, please. Yeah, here we I highlighted a correlation uh, coefficient, coefficients of determination. Next, please. So all these relationships were derived for unconfined, laterally confined, and frontally confined cases of the Central Asia rock slide database that include now more than 1,000 cases, nearly for 600 of which uh, quantitative parameters have been identified. And uh, dots correspond to um, case studies identified in this region up to now. Next, please. And if we would like to uh, uh, de uh, derive such uh, uh, relationships for uh, more detailed, uh, for subtypes, not for only for more general types. We will need larger, maybe better worldwide database to, that will allow um, elaboration of such relationships with uh, um, uh, that will retain statistical significance. Next, please. More data can be found in our book, Rock Slides and Rock Avalanches of Central Asia, that was published uh, three years ago by Elsevier. Uh, many cases are described there in much more details. Uh, next, please. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, you thank you very much, sir. Now, floor is now open floor for open question, questions. questions. If uh, someone has any doubt or any clarification from sir, then he or she can ask question or clarification. Ye yes, sir. Please, sir. You can come, sir. Yes. Please come. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry for problems with connection. Did not expect. Thank you, Dr. Storm, uh, for your excellent presentation and very meticulously uh, researched subject of our avalanches, which is quite new to us. Having said that, uh, I would like to adjust you to please throw some light on what triggers the avalanches of different types. Literally confined, frontally confined, and unconfined avalanches. And what are the main yeah. triggering factor? Because these are all seemingly structural control avalanches, basically. Uh, you see, uh, most of cases that were identified in my study are prehistoric. We do not know a real trigger from rather limited number of cases that for which triggers are known, like say, exam, for example, Usoi or Haid, we can say that uh, mobility of rock avalanches, regardless of confinement type, is practically independent of triggering factor. It is mainly the result of some internal processes uh, that uh, uh, take place within moving mass and, of course, uh, of uh, basal friction or whatever it is. It could be a seismic factor, a tectonic movement sort of thing, or some seismic effect. See, mm, mm, of course, most, most of them likely could be triggered by earthquakes in this seismically very active region. But at the same time, I must say that we know many non-seismic events that uh, have very similar shape, size, run out, and so on. 
I did not. You see, the, it should be a topic of special lecture uh, okay. because there are many cases. Uh, but here, and if you, I would, uh, Neil Ratan have my email so we can communicate if you are interested. And But uh, I must say that from my experience, trigger, triggering factor has very limited effect on rock avalanche mobility. Uh, that's okay. But means triggering means in, uh, this first uh, moment, first initiation moment basically, that must be triggered by some factor. It could be water-induced factors, it could be a tectonic moment, seismic moment. Of it course, anything. definitely. In initiation might be different. It might be uh, tectonic, it might be climatic, it might be man-made, I don't know. If you will uh, recall, if we will recall to the famous Elm rock avalanche, first scientifically described rock avalanche in 1881 in Alps, it was uh, slope was undercut by quarry. Right. You see, yeah, it is there. We have a lot of seismically induced rock avalanches, of course, but we have many non-seismically induced. When sometimes we cannot say what was exact trigger. Thank you. It is a complex Thank problem. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, I have a little clarification from Kyrgyzstan area. Uh, each area has semi-arid condition. Uh, yes. Each, all three agents. Each, all three agents are working like glacial fluvial and aeolian, and uh, uh, each area are tectonically active. Yes, you see, it, every is very tectonically active, seismically active, and basically. Uh, uh, is characterized by very arid climate, let's say, and, uh, uh, very different from what you have in Himalayas, for example, in uh, Indian part of Himalayas. Yes, sir. Uh, after seeing this photograph, I can compare the uh, field pho photograph of uh, Ladakh area, and we find similar yes. uh, conditions and sim similar signatures on those photographs. Uh, so, on the basis of uh, on the basis of your uh, photographs and our photographs, we compared that uh, when I was attending your lecture, and I found that uh, Ladakh and Kyrgyzstan has similar condition. And yes. I also see some sand carpeting over there. Yes, very similar. You are right. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Now I request to Sir uh, Professor P. Pradeep Kumar Singh to make a, a remark on this lecture. Mm -hmm. sir, sir, I request to uh, give remarks on this lecture. Sir Professor Pradeep Kumar Singh. Hello? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. It was very nice hearing to you and your experience. It connected India, Kazakhstan, and other part. And uh, I suggest my colleagues from Nagpur Center and Nilratan in particular to be in touch with you so that we can work together if possibility arises. And it was really indeed a pleasure to listening to you, sir. So I, I wish all very best for you and thanks for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director, sir. Uh, thank you, Alexander, sir. Now I invite to uh, Dr. Devend Kumar Sakre, sir, Senior Principal Scientist at our center, to give a vote of thanks. Sakre, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Neil Ratna Singh. Uh, we hear a very informative two lectures. 
and i would like to thank shri sarath kumar palleda sir director moef for a nice talk on environmental impact assessment for mining projects thereafter i would like to thank professor and dr alexander strom chief expert dynamic research center moscow for interesting lecture on rock avalanche thereafter i would like to thank our dynamic director for joining dr p k singh sir for joining and gracing this event from his uh, busy schedule thereafter i would like to thank dr gautam energy sir for his uh, nice coordination of this uh, platinum jubilee events i would like to thank scientist in charge dr partha choudhary sir for his uh, meticulous planning of this event i would like to thank a uh, moderator dr ramlu more sir and uh, dr neel ratna singh sir for uh, coordinating this uh, two lectures i would like to thanks to all, all attending and watching this uh, live session and the technical team behind this uh, occasion and making this event very successful thank you to all thank you thank you Uh, so with this we close our session for today thank you so much thank you thank you for joining us thank you bye 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 thank you very much thank you all thank you very much